right now is a more generalized formalization of PCA. So let's revise the steps together. So first thing, we do the data centering. Let me. So we center the data around zero, which means, you know, all uh, features are centered around zero. Their average is zero. Then the next step is we will project uh, the data onto, well, let's say here, we want to project it actually onto um, a k-dimensional basis, right? So this is our goal, um, stored in a U matrix of dimensionality d times k. So previously, so this is not very straightforward. First, what we want, we, we will solve this problem for u uh, belonging to r d times d. And then, uh, you know, um, later on, basically pick the number pick the number of components or dimensions. So previously, what we did, we looked at the variance. So what we want, we want to maximize the variance of what? Of the projected data x, OK? onto the direction that we were are, um, looking for. Now, uh, solving this uh, boils down basically to, um, to minimizing, uh, to maximizing, sorry, the, uh, uh, the dot product, so the uh, quadratic form U1 transpose sigma U1. Okay, so this is what we've done previously. Now, to generalize this, it's a simple thing, it's a bit straightforward. So what we do, we define a U matrix. So right here, let me just put the general case, right? So the U, the U matrix contains all, eigen, all eigenvectors. So these are the eigenvectors. So we, I have UD starting from U1, okay? This is for example, UI, okay? And it's a D by D, it's a D by D matrix. And in the next step, we will solve exactly the same problem, but we will do what we will do, we will project the matrix X onto the U basis, okay? So here, uh, maybe I should uh, make a nice uh, drawing. So if we go back to this one, so what we had, let me just do it. So right here, I'm projecting onto a single vector. So we will concatenate all vectors uh, vertically. So this is vector one. Then, right, it did not copy. Let's see. So let me just maybe draw it simply. So then we have the second vector, okay, or second direction, and then we will also project the data onto this direction. So first we project all x onto, onto the first direction. And then we project it again onto the second direction. Right. And we have here how many directions? We have d directions. So I'll get I'll we'll just project all the data onto all these d directions, okay? So all samples get projected onto those di dimensions. So here you can think about it as having your uh, data points. In here you have different di directions, so direction one. And then you have direction two, for example. And what we're doing, we're just projecting all the data onto you know, these directions one by one, okay? So this is the second direction. Okay, you guys got that. Now, this is basically x, <clears throat> x times the matrix u. And this is the projected data onto all directions. Now we're going to solve for that. So here, uh, just, you know, by analogy, we, will, we need to maximize the trace. So uh, maximizing basically the variance of x projected onto the new basis uh, U boils down to maximizing the trace of U transpose sigma U. Okay, so following the same steps, we'll get that. Uh, and then to do this, 
if you guys remember, previously we constrained the norm of u to uh, be constant. So now we're going to do this for all the vectors. So how many vectors we have? So here, let's say you have k vectors. But um, let's first look at, you know, like just use all the dimensionality. So we want to find all the uh, components. So g vectors, OK? And what comes next is just, you know, very intuitive. So we will use the Lagrangian mult uh, formula formulation to solve this constraint optimization problem. So here what we'll take, this is our first cost. So we want to maximize it. And we subtract all the uh, constraints. And the constraints is basically the norm. This is the norm um, of u. Uh, well, here it's squared. So, but it's the same thing. So basically, we uh, retrieve the uh, one, and uh, we get our constraints. Okay, so it's kind of uh, easy. So next, what is the next step? So the next step basically is to turn this into a nice uh, algebraic formulation. So we use the um, basically we transform this uh, expanded sum into a compact form using the trace. So you guys can verify this, so I'm not going to verify it now, but you can uh, transform this into a trace, a matrix lambda. So what is in lambda? Lambda is a diagonal matrix that has all the eigen vectors. So right here I'm going to... So lambda 1 till lambda d. Okay, and all of this is zero. So it's a diagonal matrix, and this is our basis, and this is an identity matrix. What is the dimensionality of the identity matrix? So if u belongs to R D times D, then the identity matrix belongs to R D. Yeah, D times D. Yeah. So same dimension. So it's right. So next, what we do is like uh, we solve the first the primal problem. So we compute the derivative. Now it's quite interesting of the Lagrangian with respect to what a matrix. OK, so deriving this, uh, we use just, uh, you know, like the matrix cookbook. You have like ready made formula, you just plug them in. And when deriving the first term, you get two sigma u. And when deriving the second term, we get uh, uh, um, minus u, uh, minus two u times lambda, okay? So when we set this to zero, what do we get? We get this. We get sigma u equals to u lambda, and this basically is the compact form that uh, includes all the eigenvectors uh, that we're looking for. So this means that these, this, the matrix u is uh, basically uh, contains all eigenvectors of sigma, okay? And lambda is basically their associated eigenvalues. So this is solving the primal problem, okay? Now, solving the dual problem, we will use this. So this is what we got out of the uh, primal problem. We'll plug it into the Lagrangian and update it. So we will replace sigma u with u lambda, right? And then what we get after doing this, so what we get um, there is another condition, guys, that we need to keep, keep in mind that the eigenvectors are orthogonal, okay? So they are uh, orthogonal, so it means that utu is equal to identity, right? So this is, uh, if you have, you know, like um, two matrices that are orthogonal, then they're, uh, if you do, you know, ut you transpose you, so we get an identity matrix. So we use this uh, right here and replace UTU with identity and then update the Lagrangian. So what we will get, we will get right here um, identity 2. So it's trace of lambda. So this is the first term. And the second term is trace of lambda i. And the second one, the last one, is basically a trace of a lambda. And here, as you guys know this, lambda times, you know, identity is lambda, right? So what you find, you find that what we, uh, our solution, the u, should have the maximum, basically, uh, values of the lambda. So in, your, in our matrix, if we look at all, like, so here, for example, is to d. So let's say this is our lambda matrix. We have lambda 1. 
lambda t. And then what we need to do is basically pick the eigenvectors with the highest lambda. So we need to sort them out. So maybe it starts with, uh, I don't know, like I'm just saying, lambda 2, lambda 5, etc. So we sort them out. And this will be the principal for the first principal component, second principal component, etc. So by uh, decreasing value. So these are this is the highest uh, value of the eigen. Uh, this is the highest value of the eigen value. Right. Okay. It's a bit boring, right? You guys got all of this. You can figure out all the maths, right? <laughs> cool. All uh, right. Now you know this. Just a few things. More insights into PCA. So here, what we have, we have like a, a data set. So these are just some intuitive uh, observations. So what do we know this, for example, when it comes to uh, the principal components? They, they capture, uh, you know, the maximum information or preserve the maximum information about the data. So when we look, for example, at PC1, uh, here for this case, its slope is basically its four and then we go up one by one, okay? So it's made of four units of feature one and only one unit, okay, of feature two. So its slope is like 0 0.25. What is, what, what is it telling us? It's telling us that basically feature one uh, is more informative, is much more informative than feature two. So somehow you can use PCA for feature selection by analyzing this. So, and also, so this is, you know, one of the things that we can uh, retain. And then the variation around the principal components. So this is another thing we can look at. So what does this mean? For example, here we take the sum. Uh, so we want to compute the variation for the first principal component. So we take the sum of the square distances of the projected points from the center and divide by the number of points uh, minus one. So let's look at this figure. So what does this mean? It means that we have our points, we project them onto PC1, okay? And then we compute the sum of all these distances, okay? So we just sum the distance to uh, the center and uh, divide by the number of samples minus one. So then we get what we get, we get the, vari the variation <coughs> of the data the variation of the data around PC1. And let's say, for example, in this case, we get 10 for uh, PC1. And when we compute the, var the variation of the data for PC2, we get 2. Because you guys can see that this value, if we project, right? So if we project the data onto PC2, we have less uh, variation. So the breadth is much smaller. Okay? So then we compute the total variation by summing them up along across you know along these uh, our two principal components in this case because we are in a two-dimensional space and then by computing just you know the percentage we get uh, for uh, PC1 we get 83 percent so we divide the variance of PC1 by the total variation uh, and then we get that uh, PC1 accounts for 83 percent of the total variation of the data so you can see that it retains a lot of information about the data and now for PC2 it retains only 16 percent okay so these are things